When I was first approached regarding this TEDx talk and the theme Talking Back, I immediately thought of all the ways as a mother I encounter back talk, be it bedtime or broccoli or even teeth brushing, my three-year-old son frequently reminds me of the ways we all struggle with words, hoping that things might be otherwise. For my son and anybody really who would talk back, talking back is the language of rebellion. They are words that reveal displeasure at the least and promise revolution at best. They are words, angry words, frustrating words, groans sometimes uttered between sobs and sighs, spoken by someone who has little hope at changing his circumstances. And yet, we talk back. As a mother, a feminist theologian, and a scholar who takes sacred words to heart, I can't help but acknowledge the latent hope at work in talking back, and specifically, words spoken back to God in the form of thoughts and prayers. Contrary to our general understanding, a situation requiring talking back does not indicate hopelessness, but rather the presence of hope. You see, talking back looks like hope even when things seem hopeless. And talking back sounds like prayer even if the words are angry and the cries of displeasure loud. And talking back demands community and action, even and especially when we feel alone. We don't usually talk back to ourselves. In most cases, we speak these words to each other. We commiserate, we find compassion, and then we begin the hard work of constructing a different kind of world together. And this is where God comes in. You see, prayer that talks back gives evidence to a different kind of hope, a hope that does things, a hope that has hands and feet, if you will, and follows the call of Jesus to care well for the least of these. It's my contention that people don't usually pray until it seems that they've run out of options. And this is why the thoughts and prayers memes that meet tragedies and fill timelines strike many as clanging symbols of vain words against the real lived conditions of life. Where will your back talking take you if there's nothing real about it, you might ask? And comedians and cultural critics are not all wrong when they call out the narcissism inherent in such posts. But I think we'd be remiss to ignore the powerful possibility of thoughts and prayers that extend beyond timelines and news feeds. Thoughts and prayers that talk back, that push back against oppressive structures, and then take back, offering liberating possibilities otherwise. Thoughts and prayers directed to God that result in loving action in the world. This is a kind of language and theology and action described by Letty Russell and Gustavo Gutierrez as having the powerful possibility of transforming the world, restoring creation, and seeking to overcome suffering. You see, thoughts and prayers need not be restricted to the worst versions of their utterance. And thoughts and prayers are only as empty as the gods you've made and the community that you form to share them in. In other words, if your prayer ends at the altar of a post, or a tweet, or even a TED talk, your God can't save you. And if your community surrounds you with affirming messages and sympathetic posts, but does not call you to imagine and then act towards the restoration of broken systems, oppressive structures, and harmful realities, then maybe you need to find new friends. Aristotle was on to something when he suggested that the best kinds of friends don't just leave you where you are, but actively push you towards excellence. They see you where you are, and they talk back. They push back against bad words, bad ways of thinking, helping reorient you toward better ways of living and thinking. This is a kind of community and theology that feminist theologians describe as a global, communal, revolutionary momentum in the form for the demand of the improvement of life. And here, in the words of revolution, we turn to Karl Marx. I know it's a strange turn, but hang with me for a moment. 
Perhaps some of his most famous words will help us here. We all recall Marx calling religion the opium of the masses. But rarely do we recall the powerful words surrounding that phrase. You see, for Marx, religion wasn't just a numbing device, an addictive substance meant to confirm and convince participation in an exploitative system marked by grueling labor. It was also the sigh of the oppressed creature, the feeling of the heartless world, and the soul of soulless circumstances. These are the words that surround the famous indicting phrase, you see, for Marx, the gods we've made reveal the conditions of life, but also harbor the collective desire that things might be otherwise. Belief together toward liberation. Thus, the believer who may sometimes long for opium also sighs and prays and finds friends She talks back prayerfully against and within her circumstances, asking for community, for help, for something. So what exactly does this kind of backtalking look like? Simply put, I think it looks like murmuring, the low grumbling sound of words spoken in community, revealing displeasure, and crying out for something better. Philosopher Ernst Bloch helps us understand the radical potential of this kind of back-talking and offers a continuum of sorts. Murmuring begins with fear and desperation, spoken first to the self. Then the murmurer looks up and sees others who share in her struggle. She notices in her despair that she is not as alone as she first imagined. And so she prays. She talks back. Here, Bloke's words are helpful. He describes murmuring as the place where real backbone first begins to grow and stand upright with a head on it, conceiving the possibility that the last word about what can be done to man has not yet been spoken. Murmuring and talking back are progressive verbs. They indicate the ongoing nature of the work and the hope to be revealed. And Bloke's right. The story isn't over yet. Back-talking prayer goes against the presumption of despair and reminds she who prays of possibilities otherwise. Divine possibilities that are both of and out of this world. A few weeks ago, my son, talking back against the consequence of timeout, took my hands, looked deep in my eyes, and said, Mama, I don't want to go in timeout. And let's face it, you don't want to put me there either. So what can we do about this together? What I love about this exchange is that he seems to understand that if something's going to change, if rules are going to be broken, we've got to do it together. And here's the point, really. Talking back, thoughts and prayers, murmuring words that reveal displeasure and promise revolution may just be the divine catalyst for building and sharing a better world here and now. Thank you.